Good? Yep. Welcome today to, to uh, start over. Welcome to today's Conquer the Clutter podcast. Uh, for those of you who didn't hear, the audiobook is complete. Um, we're sending it off for mastering the first week of January, and as soon as possible after that, um, we have actually set up a URL, so keep your eyes posted on our website, hoarding.ca, um, and on Twitter and all the other social media sites. It is Conquer the Clutter, all one word, dash, audiobook, dash, toolsandresources.com. And this is an amazing URL that will give you access to not just all the tools, resources, pictures, charts, research, uh, worksheets from the actual physical book, but there were 42 other resources that were really important that we couldn't put in the book because it would have made the book like an epistle um, that would have, the price would have been prohibitive. We're taking, with Johns Hopkins permission, we're taking all of those that they have posted on their ebook site. We're taking all of those and we're putting them on this URL as well. So you're going to have, what is that, 27 plus 42, whatever the math on that is. Very, very, very little is left out um, except the word re read instead of listen. I hope you enjoy it. Now, I specifically did that um, audio book because I discovered, I actually knew it, but it only registered after, that the written copy of the book was probably not the best medium for certain comorbidities that are very high um, in coexisting with hoarding disorder, ADD, ADHD, depression, anxiety. Some people have, as their primary representational system of how they see, view, and manage the world, their auditory sense. So that's why I felt so passionately about doing this audio book. Whether it makes any money or not is not important. We've now got the whole group of individuals who suffer with hoarding disorder and their comorbidities pretty much covered. The next challenge thanks to an invitation from Johns Hopkins, is to consider writing a therapist guide. I'm going to take a deep breath before I start that one. Anyway, it's mastered and it will be on its way if it's of use to you. So, you know, I went back and forth about today's topic because the subject of taking risk resonates with so many of the concerns and barriers that so many people have told me they encounter when trying to resolve their piles and pathways. I decided that today I would offer a mindset approach. Instead of tools, specific resources, a mindset approach that was pivotal in my own life. The topic of facing down uncertainty and the risk associated with making decisions when you're not sure you have all the information that would make you feel comfortable is a day-to-day -day reality for most. But a frequent one, you tell me the word, I, I thought agony, but you, whatever your word is, it's a frequent experience of that type for people living with hoarding disorder and those who care about them. So this is going to be a two-part series, as I said before the recording started. Today, we're going to talk about our relationship with risk. Next week, we're going to talk about making decisions that get us past the feelings associated with that risk. I want to start today, if you can indulge me, with a tiny snapshot of why a suggestion that I read this book was pivotal for me. I'm one of five children in basically a middle class, mostly Irish, hardworking, salt of the earth, careful about expenses, not prosperous, two-parent family. My mother was an O'Brien, out of an O'Regan, out of an O'Neill. So Irish customs, beliefs, challenges, and fears, and maybe even the Irish history a la Angela's Ashes, if you've ever read that, 
went back generations, okay? It was in our DNA, I'm sure. The basis for the material for today's work that we're going to discuss is a book that I recommended to you before, <clears throat> sorry, Who Moved My Cheese? Next week's podcast will be based on Yes or No, The Guide to Better Decisions. Both of them were written by Dr. Spencer Johnson, and they were published in 1999, so they're not new information, but they're solid, and they were published by Vermilion. After struggling with offering this material today, it dawned on me that the wisdom offered in these little books, like look at the size of the book, transitioned me from someone who grew up in a very risk-averse environment, playing it safe, not taking chances, working hard, keeping what you had, making it work for you, no matter whether it fit or not, no waste, just slugging through, through hard work, into someone who today um, is more able to face risk, but also able to use the wisdom I gained from these little books to anticipate when it's time to move on. And whether that's from things or ideas or jobs or relationships or whatever it is, and find the cheese, you'll understand the cheese reference in a minute, that was better suited to my current needs, trusting that there would always be enough cheese to build a platform to take the chance, despite setbacks, which often felt at the time like extremely negative events, but always moving forward and working from my strengths, trying to do what I do best, which is help people get unstuck. <clears throat> These little books actually taught me about myself and also the ways I work best taking considered risks. If this resonates with you, maybe you will get a copy of this little book. This is not a pitch. I get nothing out of it. I found the book in hardcover for under $8 on Amazon. Okay. I simply want to offer the information and the recommendation to get your own copy um, for the use you can possibly make of it. And in that, especially in that moment of decision, which can involve palpable fear, stress, anxiety, because the risk that decision means for the individual is unique to them and how risk averse they might be, maybe for reasons that came from their history or just maybe the lessons learned in life and the meaning they've applied to them. Okay. So as it turns out, Doc, I wasn't the only one. You won't be the only one. Dr. Spencer actually created this little story for himself in order to have a healthier and less stressful life himself. Some people who read it said they, it really helped them improve their lives and others couldn't understand how so many people, it's a bestseller, could find it so valuable because the story is so simple. Really, it is. Dr. Johnson agreed with both opinions because actually it's how we interpret it and how we apply it to our own situation that gives it its value. Here goes. I'm going to read some excerpts from the book because nobody says it better than Dr. Johnson. <clears throat> Once long ago in a land far away, there lived four little characters who ran through a maze looking for cheese to nourish them and make them happy. Two were mice named Sniff and Scurry, and two were little people, beings who were as small as mice, but looked and acted a lot like people today. Their names were Hem and Haw, well named. Every day, the mice and the little people spent time in the maze looking for their own special cheese. The mice, Sniff and Scurry, possessing simple brains and good instincts, searched for the hard nibbling cheese they liked, as mice often do. The two little people, Hem and Haw, 
use their complex brains filled with many beliefs, emotions, um, and fears to search for a very different kind of cheese, cheese with a capital C, which they believed would make them happy and successful. As different as the mice and the little people were, they shared something in common. Every morning, each raced out into the maze looking for their particular brand of favorite cheese. The maze was a labyrinth of corridors and chambers, some containing delicious cheese, but there were also dark corners and blind alleys leading absolutely nowhere. It was an easy place for anyone to get lost, as light often is. However, for those who found their way, the maze also held secrets that let them enjoy a better life. The mice, Sniff and Scurry, used the simple trial and error simple trial and error method of finding cheese. They ran down one corridor, and if it proved empty, they turned around and ran down another. They remembered the corridors that held no cheese, and they quickly went into other areas. They adapted. They learned from their experience, whatever the lessons were that were possible. They got lost, as you might expect, but after a while, they found their way. Like the little mice, the two little people, Hem and Haw, also use their ability to think and learn from their past experiences. However, they relied on their complex brains to develop more sophisticated methods of finding cheese. Sometimes they did well, but at other times their powerful human beliefs and emotions took over and actually clouded the way, the way they looked at things. It made life in the maze more complicated and challenging. Nonetheless, Sniff, Scurry, Hem and Haw all discovered in their own way what they were looking for. They each found their own kind of cheese. One day at the end of one of the corridors, they, they, they each found their own kind of cheese one day at the end of one of the corridors in the cheese station C. Every morning after that, the mice and the little people headed over to Cheese Station C. It wasn't long before they established their own routines. Sniff and Scurry continued to wake early every day and raced through the maze, always following the same route. When they arrived at their destination, they enjoyed the cheese. In the beginning, Hem and Haw also raced toward the cheese in Station C every morning to enjoy the tasty new morsels that awaited them. But after a while, a different routine set in for the little people. Hem and Haw awoke each day a little later, dressed a little slower, and walked, didn't race, to Cheese Station C. After all, they knew where the cheese was now and how to get there. They had no idea where the cheese came from, who put it there, they just assumed it would always be there. As soon as Hem and Haw arrived at Cheese Station C, every morning, they settled in and made themselves at home. They were becoming very comfortable now that they found the cheese. This is great, Hem said. There's enough cheese here to last us forever. The little people felt happy and successful. They thought they were now secure wasn't long before Hem and Haw regarded the cheese and they found, <clears throat> it wasn't long before Hem and Haw regarded the cheese they found at Cheese Station C as their cheese. It was a much larger store of cheese that they eventually moved their homes to be closer to and build a social life around it. To make themselves feel even more at home, Hem and Haw directed De decorated the walls and savings say with savings and even drew pictures of cheese around them that made them smile one read having cheese makes me happy we deserve this cheese hem said we certainly had to work long and hard enough to find it after a while hem fell asleep as he often did Every night, the little people would wobble home full of cheese, and every morning they would confidently return for more. This went on for quite some time. 
After a while, Hem and Haw's confidence grew into arrogance of success. Soon they became so comfortable, they didn't even notice what was happening. As time went on, Sniff and Scurry continued their routine. They arrived early every morning and sniffed and scratched and scurried around Cheese Station C, inspecting the area to see if there'd been any change from the day before. Then they would sit down to nibble on the cheese. One morning they arrived at Cheese Station C and discovered there was no cheese. They weren't surprised since Sniff and Scurry had noticed the supply of cheese had been getting smaller every day. They were prepared for what the inevitable happened and knew instinctively what to do. The mice did not overanalyze things. To the mice, the problem and the answer were both simple. The situation at Cheese Sto Station C had changed. So Sniff and Scurry decided to change, to adapt. They both looked out into the maze. Then Sniff lifted his nose, sniffed and nodded to Scurry, who took off running through the maze while Sniff followed as fast as he could. They were quickly off in search of new cheese. Later that same day, Hem and Haw arrived at Cheese Station C. Oh, but they had not been paying attention to the small changes that had been taking place each day. They took it for granted that their cheese would be there. They were unprepared for what they found. What? No cheese, Ham yelled. He continued yelling, no cheese? No cheese? As though if he shouted loud enough, somehow the cheese would appear again. Somebody would probably put it back for them. Whoever put it there in the first place remained a mystery. Who moved my cheese, he hollered. Finally, he put his hands on his hips. His face turned red and he screamed at the top of his voice. It's not fair. Haja shook his head in disbelief. He too had counted on finding cheese at Cheese Station C. He stood there for a long time, frozen in shock. He was just ready for this. He was yelling something, but Ha didn't want to hear it. He didn't want to deal with what was facing him. So he just tuned everything out. The little people's behavior, while not very productive, was understandable. Finding cheese wasn't easy. And it meant a great deal more to the little people than just having enough of it to eat every day. They built their life around it. Finding cheese was the little people's way of getting what they thought they needed to be happy. They had their own ideas of what cheese meant to them, depending on their taste. For some, finding cheese was having material things. For others, it was enjoying good health or developing a spiritual sense of well-being. If those little hem and haw had had hoarding disorder or were on that continuum, it might have been having their things and the contradiction of having free, clear, safe spaces as well that they could have a fuller life in, feel better about themselves. For Ha, cheese just meant feeling safe, having a loving family someday, living in a cozy cottage on Cheddar Lane. To him, Cheese was becoming a big cheese in charge of others and owning a big hill, a big house on top of Cameron Bear Hill. Because cheese was important to them, the two little people spent a long time trying to decide what to do. They were pretty much frozen. All we could, all we could uh, think of was to keep looking around Cheeseless Station C to see if the cheese was really gone, or if whoever put it there would put it back. While Sniff and Scurry had quickly moved on, Ham and Haw continued to Ham and Haw. They ranted and they raved at the injustice of it all. Haw started to get depressed. What would happen if the cheese wasn't there tomorrow? He'd make future plans based on this cheese. The little people couldn't believe it. How could this have happened? 
So when it warned them, it wasn't right. It's not the way things are supposed to be. Heron Hall went home that night hungry and discouraged. But before they left, Pa, at least, wrote on the wall, the more important your cheese is to you, the more you want to hold on to it, the more meaning you give the cheese, the thing that's in your way, more likely you want to hold on to it. The next day, Hem and Hall left their homes and returned to Cheese Station C again, where they expected somehow magically to find their cheese. Situation hadn't changed. The cheese was no longer there. The little people didn't know what to do. Hem and Haw stood there, immobilized, like two statues, in a fog. Ha shut his eyes as tight as he could and put his hands over his ears. He just wanted to block everything out. He didn't want to know the cheese, that the cheese supplies had gradually been getting smaller. He believed it had been moved all of a sudden. Hem analyzed the situation over and over, and eventually his complicated brain with its huge belief system took hold. Why did they do this to me, he demanded. What really was going on here? Finally, Ha opened his eyes, looked around and said, by the way, where are Sniff and Scurry? Do you think they know something we don't? Hem scoffed, what would they know? Hem continued, they're just mice. They just respond to what happens. We're little people, we're smarter than mice. We should be able to figure this out. I know we're smarter, Ha said, but we don't seem to be acting smarter at the moment. Things are changing around here, Hem. Maybe we need to change and do things differently. Why should we change, Hem asked. We're little people, we're special. This sort of thing should not happen to us. Or if it does, we should at least get some benefits. Why should we get benefits, Ha asked. Because we're entitled, Hem claimed. Entitled to what? Ha wanted to know. We're entitled to our cheese. Why? Ha asked. Because we didn't cause the problem, Hem said. Somebody else did this. We should get something out of it. Ha suggested maybe we should simply stop analyzing the situation so much and go find some more new cheese. Oh no, Hem argued. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. While Hem and Ha were still trying to decide what to do, Sniff and Scurry were already well on their way. They went farther into the maze, up and down the corridors, looking for cheese in every cheese station they could find. They didn't think of anything else but finding cheese. They didn't find any for some time until they finally went into an area of the maze where they'd never been before. Cheese Station N. They squealed with delight. They'd found what they'd been looking for, a great supply of new cheese. They could hardly believe their eyes. It was the biggest store of cheese that mice had ever seen. In the meantime, Hem and Ha were still back in Cheese Station C, evaluating the situation. They were now suffering from the effects of having no cheese. They were becoming frustrated and angry and were blaming each other for the situation they were in. Now and then, Ha thought about his mice friends, Sniff and Scurry, and wondered if they'd found any cheese yet. He believed they might be having a hard time, as running through the maze usually involves some uncertainty. But he also knew that it was likely to only last for a while. Sometimes, Ha would imagine Sniff and Scurry finding new cheese and enjoying it. He thought about how good it would be for him to be out on an adventure in the maze and to find fresh new cheese. I could almost taste it. The more clearly Ha saw the image of himself finding and enjoying new cheese, the more he saw himself leaving the cheese station sea. Let's go, he exclaimed all of a sudden. No, him, um, quickly replied. I like it here. It's comfortable. It's what I know. 
because it's dangerous out there. No, it isn't, Ha argued. We've run through many parts of the maze before. We could do it again. I'm getting too old for that, Ham said, and I'm afraid I'm not interested in getting lost and making a fool of myself. Are you? With what? With that, Ha's fear, feelings, returned and his hope of finding new cheese faded. So every day, the little people continued to do what they'd done before. They went to Cheese Station C, found no cheese, and returned home carrying their worries and frustrations with them. They tried to deny what was happening, but found it harder to get to sleep, had less energy the next day, and were becoming irritable. Their homes were not the nurturing place they once were. The little people had difficulty sleeping, and they were having nightmares about not finding any cheese. But Hem and Haw still returned to Cheese Station C and waited every day. Hem said, you know, if we just work harder, we'll find that nothing has really changed that much. The cheese is probably nearby. Maybe they just hid it behind a wall. The next day, Hem and Haw returned with tools. Hem held the chisel while Haw banged on the hammer until they made a hole in the wall of Cheese Station C. They peered inside. They found no cheese. They were disappointed, but they believed they could solve the problem. So they started earlier. They stayed longer and they worked harder. But after a while, all they had was a larger hole in the wall. Ha is, was beginning to realize the difference between activity and productivity. Maybe, Ham said, we should just sit here and see what happens. Sooner or later, they have to put the cheese back. He wanted to believe that. So each day he went home to rest and returned reluctantly with him to Cheese Station C. But the cheeses never appeared. They never reappeared. By now, the little people were growing weak from hunger and stress. Ha was getting tired of just waiting for their situation to improve. He began to see that the longer they stayed in their cheeseless situation, the worse off they would be. Ha knew they were losing their edge. Finally, one day, Ha began laughing at himself. Ha, 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 look at us. We keep doing the same things over and over and wonder why things don't get any better. If this wasn't so ridiculous, it would be even funnier. Ha did not like the idea of having to run through the maze again because he knew he could get lost and he had no idea where he'd find any cheese. But he had to laugh at his folly when he saw what his fear was doing to him. He asked him, where did we put our running shoes? It took a long time to find them because they were they put everything away when they found their cheese. They initially found cheese at Cheese Station C. They were settled in for life with these values, beliefs, and approaches and mindset. Thinking that anything that they'd had before would be there and they wouldn't need them again, even if they did need them. As Hem saw his friend getting into his running gear, he said, you're not really going out into the maze again, are you? Why don't you just wait here with me until they put the cheese back? Because you don't get it, Ha said. I didn't want to see it either, but now I realize they're never going to put yesterday's cheese back. The only thing to do is to find today's new cheese. Hem argued, but what if there's no cheese out there? Or even if there is, what if you don't find it? I don't know, Ha said. He'd asked himself those same questions too many times that felt, and then felt the fears again that kept him where he was. He asked himself, where am I more likely to find cheese? Here or somewhere out in the maze ahead? He painted a picture in his mind. He, he visioned it. He imagined it. He saw himself venturing out into the maze with a good attitude, positive thinking, and a smile on his face. While this picture surprised him, 
It made him feel a bit better. It made him feel pretty good, actually. He saw himself getting lost now and then in the maze, but he felt confident that he would eventually, if he just kept going forward, he would find new cheese out there. And all the good things that came with new cheese, he gathered up his courage. Then he used his imagination to paint the most believable picture he could with the most realistic details of him finding and enjoying the taste of new cheese. He saw himself eating Swiss cheese with holes in it, bright orange cheddar and American cheeses, Italian mozzarella, and wonderful soft French camembert cheese. And then he heard him say something and realized they were still at Cheese Station C. Pa said, sometimes, Hen, things change and they never are the same again. You know, this looks like one of those times. That's life. Life moves on and so should we. Hall looked at his emaciating companion and tried to talk sense into him. But Ham's fears had turned into anger and he wouldn't listen. Ha didn't mean to be rude to his friend, that he, ha that he had to laugh at how silly they both had been. As Ha prepared to leave, he started to feel more alive, knowing that he was finally able to laugh at himself and let go and move on. Laugh hard. Ha laughed and announced, it's maze time. Hem didn't laugh and he didn't respond. Ha picked up a small, sharp rock and wrote a serious thought on the wall for him to think about, as was his custom. Ha even drew pic a picture of cheese around it hoping it would help him to smile, lighten up, and go after the new cheese. Him didn't want to see it. That message read, if you do not change, you will become extinct. Another question was, would you do, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Another question he asked, smell the cheese often so you know when it's getting old. Movement in a new direction helps you find new cheese. When you stop being afraid, you feel good. Imagining yourself enjoying your new cheese leads you to it. The quicker you let the lovable cheese that you want be a vision in your mind, a, a picture of reality, the sooner you are more likely to find that new cheese. It's safer to search in the maze than to remain in the cheeseless situation. All beliefs do not lead you to new cheese. When you see that you can find and enjoy new cheese, only when you can see it, when you allow yourself to imagine it, does your course change. Noticing small changes early helps you to adapt to the bigger changes in the cheese. Is the handwriting on your wall? And does it say something like, change happens, keep moving toward the cheese because they keep moving the cheese. Anticipate change, get ready for the cheese to move. Monitor change, smell the cheese often so that you know when it's getting old. Adapt to change quickly. The quicker you let go of old cheese, the sooner you can find and enjoy new cheese. Change, move with the cheese and enjoy change. Yes, actually enjoy it. Savor the adventure and enjoy the taste. Learn to savor. The, the taste of all new change. Be ready to change quickly when needed and enjoy it. The cheese, the new cheese, the new adventure, the new opportunities again and again. I'm bringing this podcast, this part of it to an end. I read a little faster than I thought I would. But what I want to close with 
in this segment and then open up the chat line, is I hope this gives you pause for thought and that you can find useful ways um, to, to use this information as we approach the new year. This new year will, despite its setbacks and its challenges, will be full of cheese in whatever form it takes. Don't be afraid to find your cheese and allow yourself to enjoy it. Okay, over to the chat box. All right. <laughs> As Zoe says, a therapist guide would be so valuable, but no pressure. Meredith, I'm not sure it's active yet. No, no, the URL is not active yet. I'm just giving you folks the first information on it so that you'll be, th there's no limit to who can go to that URL. Um, the people on the podcast, obviously, um, but the um, other URL for the actual audio book, um, that, uh, that will be, um, that will come later when the, the book is ready. Okay. Happy holiday. Silver says, happy holiday, everyone. Good morning. Alina, hello, I've read Who Moved My Cheese. It was a simple, yes, but powerful message. Love it. Through the years to this day, the message impacts many aspects of my thinking about everything. Good for you, Alina. Hence plan B and plan C. Great how you related to hoarding tendencies. That was the reason I brought it to you, was because um, I actually, my grandson is getting ready to go into pre-med and make some course um, choices and things and where he's gonna go. And, and he's 23, tw just turned 24 actually. And I thought, what could I give him? And the two things that came to mind were, who moved my cheese? And the um, no to yes, how to make better decisions. Uh, and as I was scanning them before I gave it to them, him to them to him, I thought this is so applicable. Why did I not see this before? This is so applicable. The fear of risk taking. That if I let this thing go, what will I do if I need it? And just going back to fear and cons really super conservative thinking. Now, we're not talking about things. Not all change, okay, is, is positive. It isn't. It's not a guarantee. But things never stay the same. They, they either get worse or they get better. So the only way for them to get better, since you can't go backward, in time is to keep moving forward and learn how to make the best considered decisions about the options that present themselves as possible. I had a, a really great segment in the middle um, to kind of illustrate from my grandparents' lives. Um, I, I may include it um, next time about being thrown into an unfair, unfortunate situation for my grandfather and a desperately like shot out of the dark um, setback for my grandmother and how each of them moved on their path to the same place, not knowing each other, but there was a synchronicity. Uh, if you just, it was like a dance. If you just could stand back from the details and see how the choices they made led them to safety and um, a loving relationship that, and security and happiness that was born of setback and absolute misery. Um, for and courage, but it took courage. It took facing down the fear in whatever best way you could every day 
All right. You don't have to be a hero. You don't have to be superhuman. You don't have to be one thing you're not. All right. But you have the ability. Everybody, don't give that up. You have the ability to make a better decision today. It doesn't have to be the best decision. Not every, every choice you make in your life today or any other day has to be the best decision. That, that, that fear, that belief, oh, I can't make a decision until I know what the best decision is. Okay, that holds people back because you, the fact is you never know. We never have all the information we need to know up front that that would turn out to be a positive decision. All right. And just learning how to make considered decisions. We're not talking reckless here. We're talking considered decisions about your stuff, what you do need, what you do want, what you can, what you can live without, what you can let go of in the interest of opening up those spaces. So you can build and have a, an active life every day. You can have a social life. You can have people in if that's something you want to do. You can be proud of yourself. You can open your door and not worry that whoever's at the door is going to look and see and you're going to be like red in the face. Okay, I've heard, I've heard and seen it all, folks. A livable, safe, secure space where you can have a safe, healthy and as reasonably happy life as is possible for anybody that's what we're looking for okay yeah. Where are we at? Kendra yes sometimes things change and we'll never be the same again that's so oh no kidding Kendra really good observation that's so fitting for today and for some relationships it's true. And as relationships change, they morph into positive or not so positive or ending. Um, sometimes it's only down the road, right? down the road that you can see what the trajectory of that change actually led you to opportunities that didn't feel like opportunities at the time. Right? They felt like setbacks. But you made a choice, a considered choice, the best choice you could figure out. And that yielded something that actually led you somewhere that, hallelujah, you are today. All right? Don't be afraid of change. Change is the one certain in everybody's life. No, Joan, it does sound like a good COVID story. I wouldn't be out looking for cheese, however. I'd be wearing a mask, social distancing, washing my hands, wearing nitrile gloves if I could, and not going out if I don't have to. <laughs> uh, Marsha, I'm a cheese head from Wisconsin. Good for you. Um, I love how story this story enables me or anyone to see clearly stand back. Oh, and thank you very much, Maureen. Thank you, because I'm a, I'm a good storyteller and reader. Okay. Um, Jim, um, can you look at... Um, oh, that's taken care of. Okay. Thanks. Chain, it does take energy and courage and good thinking to make a decision. However, John, sometimes courage, okay, I'm gonna tell you a tiny story. So I, I had um, my grandson, um, when he was a little, like little, like maybe four, um, had to have a lot of dental work done. And he hadn't been to a dentist before. And he didn't like the first visit when they assessed it. And so he was, he knew he had to do it. Mom and dad said, and he knew, he's a smart kid. He knew he had to do it. He was really, like, really afraid, really afraid. And I said to him, I, I just broke my heart. And I said to him, you know what, honey? If you do it and you do the best you can, 
okay, add it. You do what the dentist tells you, no matter what, because you can, that'll be there. You can trust the dentist, okay? I'll get you a transformer. There, some kind of, tra there was a transformer about this big. It was sort of like mecca to a four-year-old at that time. Um, and so I got him the transformer and he came back and he needed six, six fillings. Huh. You can imagine to a four-year-old what that was like. And I went to give him the transformer and he said, no, granny. He said, I tried, but I wasn't brave. And I said, what? And I looked at my son and I looked back at him and he's got tears in his eyes and he said, I wasn't brave, granny. He said, I cried. And I said, did you let the dentist do what he needed to do? Yeah, he said, but I wasn't brave. I cried. And I said, honey, courage is being afraid and doing it anyway. Here's this transformer and granny will get you another one. <laughs> so to Joan, courage is simply doing the best you can do that day. Okay. And it uh, courage does not often feel like courage. It feels like fear. All right. But it's making a considered assessment and decision, knowing that that is the best you can come up with, with the information you have available to you and doing it anyway. All right. And that has to do with the sorting, Elaine scaling process. That has to do with figuring out, being true to yourself. Okay. Courage is about figuring out, honestly, what are your one, two, threes? What are those precious things? And nobody gets to tell you what those are. Okay. Courage is also, okay, really, truly. What do I not have that relationship with here that are seven, eight, nine, tens and just acting on faith, let it go. The feelings, whatever feelings they are, all right, and they're probably not happy feelings, um, they will dissipate. The seven, eight, nine, ten feelings will dissipate as you let go of things at that end. And then having the courage, and it's not necessarily going to feel that you know you're making the right decision and it often does not feel good, all right? To take the best example of your one, two, threes and the best example of your seven, eight, nine, tens and figure out based on your own internal experience that at that time, which is closer to the one, two, threes? They're probably fours. So just set them aside. You may have room for the fours, many of them. And which is closer to the seven, eight, nine, tens? Those are the sixes. Put them with the seven, eight, nine, tens. And now we only have the fives to deal with. Because pretty much when we get the seven, eight, nine, tens gone, the six, seven, eight, nine, tens gone, we're going to have room for the one, two, threes. I've never known that not to happen, all right? probably a lot of the fours, the courage comes with the fives, all right? The courage comes with the fives. Go back to conquer the clutter, set the criteria, remind yourself, remember it said, smell the cheese, really relish the cheese, really have a rich experience with the cheese. Take that and then decide about the fives. You cannot, ex yeah, it's true, Silver. You can't expect tomorrow to be like yesterday was. Today leads to tomorrow and turns its back on yesterday. You know, I don't know whether it does turn its back on it because even when experiences happen, even when events happen from the past, once, depending on what kind of experiences they were, it takes more or less time to kind of chew down on them and assimilate um, what the meaning was of that. We always have the opportunity 
to learn from even the most negative experiences. We always have that. If we give our, if we just stop, just stop the the hullabaloo in our heads and the pressure and the self recrimination and you know the the should 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 we should ourselves to death. If we just can give ourselves some peace, all right, just some peace. Let it percolate down. Let you find the meaning of even something that felt really negative today. Really? Really? It can be, you can realize there was a wisdom that you learned. Right? I learned that, it sounds hokey, but I learned that on that long uh, drive to work that morning. Because I was as lower, low as a tuck, as a duck's behind, and when I looked up and I saw that sunrise, it was such an immediate like whoa. And then I just didn't go back down inside right away for whatever reason. I stayed open just long that window long enough that I could go. Wow, I feel a fair bit better right now. Whoa. Did it last the whole day? No, it did not last the whole day. All right, it doesn't turn on a dime. This isn't Hollywood. And that reminded me so many times as I've had challenges um, coming, you know, in my life subsequent to that. Okay, you can't necessarily change the events. You can have a heavy influence on the meaning. Don't, and sometimes when you're in an event and it's not the most positive, sometimes it's okay to say to yourself, this is not the time to decide what this means. It's too acute, it's too vibrant, it's too something. No, this is about emotion because the meaning is the balance. That meaning that can guide you from your own experiences. That's the balance between what we think in our head and what we feel in our heart, all right, in our feelings. And we run it by the frontal lobe of our brain and we go, hmm, sometimes it's okay to give yourself a little time before you decide what an event was. And sometimes it turns into a positive because you've learned from it and you know you never want to repeat that mistake again. All right, just keep moving forward. Okay, got two new messages. Let me see what I have. Um, Kendra, recently it was suggested that I reread this book and continue to read it once a year. Now I see why. There, there are so many takeaways from this small book that I can apply to. It's, it's not just wording. It's many areas of your life. Okay. And the beautiful thing about it is nobody's giving you a formula. Nobody's telling you the answer. Okay. I don't have the answers for you. What I have is a whack and load of experience from people who do because they have lived it. And I've tried to remain humble and respectful enough of their experience and the wisdom and takeaway messages to bring that forward and offer that to you, as well as my clinical expertise in how to do a mind shift, how to get yourself to a point where you have the focus and the energy to be just that little more self-regulated, okay? And so Kendra, if you like that one, wait till you hear the one next week. It's kind of like step two. Um, all right. Yeah. Carl, it's okay if you're late. You came. And the good news is, this is going to be recorded and you can catch up with everything you missed um, in, at, the le at your own leisure. Would you please hold up the second book? Um, I don't have the second book. I gave it to Jacob, all right? But I read it before I gave it to him. And, um, but I it's 
It's coming uh, day after tomorrow. So I'll hold up the second book next week, okay? My issue, yeah, Colette, I know. My issue is carving out that 15 minutes a day. I do so much better when I have someone on the phone. Yes, exactly. While I clutter, clear. I live alone now since my wife. Carl, you know what? It's true. And how do we do that? How do we do that? Um, have clutter buddies. How many people, how many people feel they need a clutter buddy? Okay. How many people? It's always easier with two. Send me a list of all the people, Carl, that you think can and are the right people, not bossy boots, uh, to be a clutter buddy for you. And let's work out a schedule of when each one of them is available so that when you do that 15 minutes, all right, you do it at a time when they can be available. You kind of get a little strategic with this, all right? Maybe you start to think of, so if you do that for me, what can I reciprocate? Reciprocity is really important. And I'm betting that you don't have um, any shortage of skills in other areas um, than sorting. All right, I'm betting that. So what skills does somebody who would be a good clutter buddy just need a friend to listen? What skills do you have? Send me that email, Carl. I want to hear from you. Okay. Clutter buddies unite. Yeah, that's true. I'm available. Okay, you know, I'm going to run that by the group because one of the things that we didn't contract with was sort of open transference of contact. So I want to make sure anybody who is good with in the podcast um, format, so you, you met them on the podcast, if you're open to a clutter buddy, okay, if you really, and you're willing to be a clutter buddy in return for somebody else, just send me an email to elaine.birchall at hoarding.ca, all right? And let's see whether that's something that we can build from there. If people want it, if it's safe, it's got to be safe. And remember, a clutter buddy never gives advice. A clutter buddy offers the benefit for whatever the person can use it for of their experience, but that does not mean it's the answer for anybody, okay? <laughs> we seem to have a bunch. Yeah, okay, right. I've not been open to this book previously because of the baggage I have lined on working with an employee from. And now it really feels to be an MA. I know it's exactly, I was there. I was there, chaos and how it really feels to be an amazing manipulated by yes. How do you suggest reframing it to be helpful for hoarding and life decisions? Let's talk more about that one, KS, okay? Let's talk more about that. Um, that's slightly more complicated, but there are many people I'm sure who are listening that have had that experience or are in the middle of it. Yeah, my perfectionism often gets in the way. Go to the podcasts on perfectionism and procrastination. Listen to them, listen to them, listen to them. If, if it's possible, record them. All right, record them in, in, into your, your phone. Put your earphones on and just let it sink in and percolate down. There's nothing Jane Burka and Lenora Ewan don't know about perfectionism, and procrastination. Their book is my Bible. They are my mentors on that. Oh, a podcast. Oh, a slob comes clean. That's terrible. Cara, oh, Deanne. I hope it's a kinder podcast than a slob comes clean. Okay. Well, that's good. If it helped you get out of frozen and overwhelmed, that's good. 
really great music can do that too, okay? I'm hoping they don't call anybody a slob. Okay, Alina, great. Okay, okay. Jim, can we keep all these messages? Because one of the things people could do who are present today is you can send me, I, know, I hadn't thought of that, send it in the chat. If you're, if you're interested in being a clutter buddy, but that would mean you have to accept a clutter buddy. Um, if you feel safe, if that's something that you uh, would do, you'd be open to, you feel safe about that, you feel through lots of encounters with those people on the podcast, that that's, that's a good thing for you, um, then send it in the chat. Uh, I'll leave the chat open uh, for a while. And um, let's see if that is a positive for people. Okay, so I'm going to end now. You folks have a wonderful week. Have a happy, happy new year. Stay safe. Be well. Um, and I will see you next Wednesday with part two. Take care. I'll leave this open for about maybe 10 minutes, okay, for people to send messages if they want to.